This episode is sponsored by Aircon, one of the UK's finest analogue gaming festivals taking place at the Harrogate Convention Centre between the 13th to the 15th of March next year. Tickets are on sale now. Check out the website, which is aircon.uk, or check out our links in the show notes for more information. Welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for September. Now, <laughs> joining me today, he's from New York. New York is a hell of a town. You know the Bronx is up, but Brooklyn's down. Because they don't know his name, they only know his initials. He was there with, he's in deep water games. Um, not elected officials. <laughs> <laughs> he quit his job, he cut his hair, he almost cut his boss because, you know, he doesn't care. <laughs> he tried to bring a game to Kickstarter earlier this year. Ooh. It's called Sovereign Skies, and he's here. It's Mr. Aaron A. Wilson. Hello, hello. There you go, sir. Your freestyle game is, it's pretty hot, I gotta say. I've got to admit, I, st- I stole that from the Beastie Boys. Yeah. So there you go. Really? Like oh, oh, you didn't make that all up yourself? No. That's good, though. I, thank you. I appreciate that. I might have to cut it out because it was rubbish, but you know, you can't have everything. <laughs> um, how are you doing, sir? Are you glad you're on the show? <laughs> I, I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm glad I'm on the show, especially after uh, <clears throat> us pushing it back a couple of times like we did. But I, I'm. this is actually perfect timing because the Kickstarter is launching Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. So by the time yeah. everyone hears this, it will be probably be live i imagine um, so, or finished or so, finished depending on yeah. how long it takes me to edit you know <laughs> go back it right now <laughs> thanks for listening no, it's fine it's fine no i know thanks for you know and until next week goodbye <laughs> um no but as i say earlier this year you brought um sovereign skies to kickstarter and then for whatever reason which we will have a little chat on you decided to kind of push it back and then kind of relaunch it again yes um two things we've got to do i think we should obviously we have to say hello to everybody who's out there thank you for listening the reason that we do this is quite simply because (laughs) there's not enough podcasts out there about board games no and the second reason that i'm doing this is because we're now at position 23 in the iTunes Azerbaijan games charts well, and I'm thinking we can I'm thinking we can go to 22 the, <laughs> this th- this interview I is think definitely that's a possibility. Gonna, yeah it's definitely going to give you a boost i can feel it that's a very confident it's, it's and strong the statement mr Wilson. i might have, <laughs> it's I the might energy need to hold in the room that. anyway it's the, it's the energy in your room, you know, but, or is that your AC? We don't. We yeah, that's no it, yeah, that's the AC on in the background. Sorry about that. That's fantastic. It's okay. We can edit it out because we have the power and the authority. Um, in terms of yourself, though, because this is all about it is your night or your day. Um, were you? I mean, back at the beginning. I mean, was. Did you go through kind of like the normal thing was like board games something that you would that you had in your life from a young age? You know, did you go through the monopoly type phase and everything like that when yeah. you were when you were a young slip of a man? Or? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I I I played I played a certain amount of board games. I just liked games when I was a kid, um, and I liked video games. I played a lot of your classic board games: Monopoly, Risk, Stratego. Mm-hmm. Uh, those were like my go-tos back in, you know, when I was a, in middle schoolish that, that era. And then, and then D- uh, Dungeons and Dragons was, was a game that I started playing as a young nerd as well, which I enjoyed very much. Um, mm-hmm. I never jumped on like the magic, the gathering thing that, that, that didn't take for me. Uh, I was in college at that time and I sort of st- stop gaming altogether for a long time. Although I was still sort of, there's something about the system of games that 
draws that has always drawn me in and, and yeah. being able to manipulate and create a system that creates fun. So I was, I was still dabbling in like uh, authoring games at the time, but they were sort of these role playing game systems. I was trying to, trying to kind of do myself on the side without having any sort of community, which was just a strange little hobby to have alone <laughs> in college. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So like when I wasn't, being an art school party kid, I was I was doing that for some reason. Oh. Um, yeah. So, uh, so what did you do at college then? Um, I, I majored in photography and video. Um, oh, and okay. and so uh, after I came out of college, you know, I did a lot of graphic design because that's kind of where the easier money was, at least mm. in terms mm-hmm. of m- my capabilities. And so now I still do that. I'm a creative director. Uh, at an ad agency in, in New York, um, and and that's really why I'm able to pull in a lot of my graphic design skills into the game and into prototyping when I'm when I'm doing that. What does a creative director do apart um, from me? Obviously, putting up a very high pitched voice. Is it kind of <laughs> like a movie director? Are you the person that kind of goes, "This is my vision." Somebody has given me almost like a brief and a script. And we're all going to sit around. Having a high pitched voice in the beginning is very important, and then you have to go right. kind of low. Uh, <laughs> no, but yeah, it, it's true. A lot of it is is being able to to pitch yourself to clients and and speak to uh, the art direction, and then you, and then get your hands dirty as well. You're doing a lot of the work mm-hmm. and and really critiquing a lot of work from from various teams uh, for the artwork that's happening within whatever campaign. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, I, I I work on a few brands right now. Actually, one of my brands just got pulled off the shelves was Zantac. (laughs) I don't know if you heard about (laughs) Zantac, but there's, is that, no, I don't know what that is. Is that like a painkiller? It's a, it's a a heartburn drug and there's apparently a carcinogen in it, which is really a shame because we were doing some awesome, Social stuff for <laughs> Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. That must have been a bit of a bad day. It was, it was a burn. Office. But I'm what did they do? Like, did they say, like, oh, you're going to get a bit of indigestion here when you hear the news I'm having? Says, oh, sorry, I got, I got yeah. a couple of Zantac in the cupboard. I'm going to taste like, no, no, you better not, you, you better not take them. Yeah. Have, you know, have some Gaviscon instead. You know, have the, have the little liquid kind of, um, the liquid refreshment that'll kind of, can I yeah, help you? Just drink milk. Um, You're fine. <laughs> are you so you in charge of quite a few teams then? Yeah, um, a, a couple of uh, small art and copy teams report to mm-hmm. me and another my copy partner guy, um, and then we work on pitches and concepts and stuff as well. So it's it's actually a lot of work. Um, I would rather be designing board games uh, full time. And that's uh-huh. that's what I enjoy the most. But I don't know. Maybe maybe I wouldn't if if I did it full time. Maybe I would be I like, oh, I wish I could do advertising full time. <laughs> I, I wish I could go back to seventy five hour weeks <laughs> and at least have at least have other members of the team. I could get doing stuff instead of having to do everything my myself. You know, um, when you got out of college, I mean, when did you start to go back into? The board game hobby then? Or were you always um, kind of skirting on the peripheral with the RPG stuff anyway? Yeah, uh, no, I kind of, I kind of, the, the RPG thing kind of dropped off um, for a while. And I was just doing, we were, I was casual gaming. Like we, I, we had a risk night with, with some roommates when I, when I was young in, in New York City. Um, hmm. Played a lot of that. Uh, risk is too long. But, <laughs> but, but I very much enjoyed that. And then at some point, I dis- at, right when Dominion came out, I discovered that. And I had a friend, I think it was a it was a recommendation from a friend who was actually like a magic the gathering competing guy. I can't remember his name. But he, he recommended, oh, this new game, it's really cool. It's like kind of self-contained magic, mm-hmm. which it really isn't. But uh, but in the in the way that you play cards, I guess so. And, and that kind of really started to hook me in, uh, back into getting into kind of buying games, collecting more games, getting into knowing more games, 
Um, yeah. A friend of mine bought Stone Age kind of back then too. And, and I, Oh yeah. I yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that was kind of me dipping my toes in there. And then, and then I was just really into like anything kind of card based. Um, and then I wanted to, I wanted to, see if I could take a crack at it since I had kind of dabbled in the world of uh, role playing, like dealing with like system mechanics, basically um, seeing if I can do some board game mechanic type things. And then, uh, yeah. So I made a couple of like bad um, deck builders, you know, basically dominion knockoff kind of things um, just yeah. as kind of practice. Um, and, and that's kind of where, and then I started to do this like uh, sci-fi theme and I kind of started to pull that through and creating a couple different games and that's really where Sovereign Skies came from um, it was really just a much later iteration of one of those original deck builders Do you think magic to me is a funny thing because I know people that all they'll play is magic and yeah. that's all they'll do they'll not touch anything else it's like the um, yeah. It's a whole subculture in, in It's itself. like the, do you know what it's it's like the FIFA and the um, it's like the FIFA and the NFL mm-hmm. games on the PlayStation Four, and you'll get some people that they have a PlayStation Four, yeah, and all they will buy every year is like the latest NFL football right. game, the, the, latest, the newest Madden, um, right? The newest Madden, or the late, you know, or the latest kind of FIFA football game, or or um, yep. Pro Evolution Soccer as well, as, and, that, and that, or the Call of Duty, and that's all they'll buy. Yeah. And sometimes with Magic, I know players that that is all they'll play, and they won't even go as far as maybe they'll dabble in a deck builder on something else. But usually, they just return to Magic because that's that's what they do. That is their hobby, and it's kind of like a. a I can see. I that's why I kind of never got into it because I knew if I if I got into it. Yeah, it's it's a kind I'd of get, a rabbit hole. I, I, I yeah, I have a, a very large appreciation for 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 magic and, and the design and all of yeah. what goes into, especially the beautiful art. But really, just, just the the play testing that must ha- the rigorous play testing they got to do to to make sure that things work and yeah, you know, give it. You know, they got to know the power creep and all those funny words mm-hmm. they use. <laughs> 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 or the words that they they use, but they don't allow other people to use, <laughs> which I've always found really fantastic. When some when I said to somebody like I said, "Oh, you, you're tapping that," it's like, "No, I, I'm not allowed to say that." Right. It's like it's if I say that in my I if I say that in my game, I can potentially kind of get um, sued for a kind of copyright yeah. type thing. And I thought I thought you couldn't copyright mechanics. It's like, well, you know, you can't really copyright com- mechanics, but somehow what they've done is they've got a way of actually copywriting what they call. Right. That mechanic, which right. I find absolutely fascinating, yeah. even though you might have to bleep it out on... of this podcast. Tap, bleep, tap. Well, you know, <laughs> I you see, I'm okay in the UK because oh. I can say I went to the kitchen. I was going to make myself a cup of coffee, <laughs> so I went. I got the kettle. I turned on the tap, <laughs> and then I filled it with water, and then I turned the tap off. <laughs> you know, if I was in America and I said that, then I get the Magic the Gathering folk, Wizard of the Coast or whatever, would be straight on the door going, did you just say you used the tap to fill your kettle? <laughs> you know, that's how you, you're lucky you got, you get to use faucet. When I go to the bar and I I'm say, sure. uh, what, do you, what do you have on bleep? So, so I don't... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if I brought out a card game and there was a way of um, exhausting cards, I would say you were fauceting them. <laughs> just, <laughs> just that works. Just to just to say it, just like bring it on, bring it on, Wizards of the Coast, bring it on. I'm gonna get a cease and desist. Although <laughs> I'm just gonna check my email. <laughs> they know even while I'm recording a podcast, I'm not doing something. I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing, which is all, which is all kind of. Very well. Um, did you end up like down the line? Have you got a reasonable kind of collection as you have gone, as you've kind of gone on? Do you kind of like? Did you get into the thing of a regular games group, and you were like, "Oh, I like this, I like that," and have you kind of stuck with the kind of the deck, the kind of the card games as you've gone? Yeah, yeah, I have. I mean, I've I've kind of leaned more into euros, especially li- kind of light, medium euros. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my sweet spot. I'll play heavier games. Um, I g- game with a group uh, up here in the burbs uh, and they like to play heavy games. So I get to experience those. I'm just usually 
they're usually uh, just not really my cup of tea. After after mm. hour three, I'm like, okay, I'm ready for this game to be over. But um, <laughs> I mean, that's that's really why I like to design in a space where you keep a game to within an hour, because um, that's to me is the, yeah. where the fun is. And and I if I'm gonna play, I, I can keep playing games, but I'd rather just play another game for another hour and then another game for another hour so I can have that variety within that time. So a lot of my collection is kind of in that medium range. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, um, have you got anything at the moment that's kind of like, you know, do you really kind of enjoy or getting into? Or are you just saying, are you absolutely crazy? I'm in the middle of actually putting a Kickstarter out there. The last thing <laughs> that's I'm exactly doing right. is yeah. playing, what are you is playing games. Uh, you, sorry. Fool, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> what are you tapping nuts um no that's me bleep see this then i did the bleep never mind i got confused <laughs> now you're sued now you'll be in court <laughs> uh no i don't have anything i'm i mean uh I, we've been my wife and i've been playing a lot of of sintra which is the uh azul sequel i really enjoy yeah. that she enjoys it uh she doesn't play a lot of games, but um, so will any game that works well at two player and plays fairly quickly. Um, sh- we we play more of than other games, even though I have preferences for some heavier games that I actually own that I can't play at home. I got to take it to the, my game group, which is fine. But um, yeah, like I'm looking at Bosque right now that just came out, which is really great. Um, that's from Maple Games. You know yeah, one? it's the one with the trees and the leaves yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, it's I, like I, it's almost like a follow up to photosynthesis. Yeah, that's yeah, good. it is right. That's what I've heard people yeah. saying it. Yeah, it's it's really nice. Um, like I have the whole Alex Kevern collection. Um, oh. If you know who he is, uh, Gold West and uh, yes, passing through Petra. He used to live up here. He moved to LA, so I used to game with him oh, right. and get uh, get notes from him with playtesting and whatnot. Um, also, like, uh, uh, and I think you had him on, uh, Daniel Newman. He's a he's a buddy of mine. Lives here in New York. I game yeah, with he's... I game with Daniel and Gil uh, for playtesting a lot. Um, also, uh, <clears throat> uh, Ryan Courtney, who who did uh, Pipeline. So those, it's yeah. nice to have that group here to be able to like bounce stuff off. But I I also enjoy their games a lot. God, Pipeline is a is an ass kicker. That game is hard <laughs> i mean you're mentioning daniel newman and all i'm thinking about is have have you met the dog yet i mean that is all i'm thinking about his new one cosmo i have not met that yeah. dog no i haven't met the puppy uh, last time i visited him he had his other dog that has passed since which yeah my condolences to daniel uh but but yeah but i mean i always mean to uh go over and say hi to his puppy i don't know <laughs> he just keeps on putting pictures on like um twitter and it's like it's just kind of like it's temptation it's kind of like oh look i've got a really you know, look at my new dog and i'm just like yes i am looking at your new dog i would like your new dog very very much but you know just <laughs> very cute just dog. to know the fact uh, yes i know it's a very very cute dog i've told daniel personally it's a very very cute dog and when he comes back when he comes back on the show again i shall be asking him to put the dog on skype camera so we can actually see the dog and then it'll just, all it'll be is 45 minutes of me going right. oh, did a bit of fish a whole episode did a look at a fish a whole episode of puppy gonna talk be. perfect uh, that's exactly how it's going to going to be but is that are they quite um like obviously chatting with Daniel and Gil and you know are they quite kind of when you were when you were taking them through kind of the sovereign sky stuff were they good enough a friend that they told you when stuff was working and good enough a friend that they told you when stuff just wasn't going to work or oh, yeah. you should con- consider doing it kind of like a different way <clears throat> absolutely that i mean i go to them specifically for their ruthlessness <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Dan- Daniel's he's he he doesn't pull punches, especially with me. Uh, so yeah, and and Gil is it's just he's he's a straight shooter too. I I I absolutely uh, yeah value all of their input. And they they're 
it, yeah, they'll <laughs> they'll never sweet talk me for certain because I make too many dad jokes during playtests for them to feel bad about. Ever I want to. I've got to hear this. You can't say you make dad jokes and then not tell us that dad joke. <laughs> I mean, are they quite bad? That I mean, how bad are these dad jokes? I mean, you're obviously you said you you know that's what you said. Oh, I've got a couple of kids, and it's uh, like yeah, and now you're I, dropping dad jokes. So we've got to hear these dad jokes. Yeah, I, I think it's it's hard to like you can't pull up a dad joke because a dad joke is just a a really bad <laughs> pun in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> so I think yeah, I'm I'm ready to ta- I'm ready to I think I'm ready to bleep out. There's my dad joke. There it is. I'm ready to bleep out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but hanging around with these guys did that did that inspire you to kind of push push ahead with Sovereign Skies then? Oh, absolutely. Because I mean, I mean, was it a case that you became friends with them as you were going through Sovereign Skies, or were they always friends in the background and you were hearing of them? Kind of, you know, what are you doing? Well, I'm bringing Dead Man's Cabal here, or <laughs> no, <laughs> no, going, oh, no, right, yeah, okay. uh, no. It was it, it was absolutely me working on a game without. Or working on games without having any sort of uh, contact with the, the the board game community without knowing it, uh, and then me figuring out, well, I gotta go to I gotta go to some conventions. Oh, there's some here's New York people. I just meet people. Uh, I went to Unpub mm-hmm. um, four or five years ago. Met people there, um, <clears throat> and. When I started gaming, when I after I moved here, I started gaming, and really Alex Kevin put me in touch with with uh, Gil and uh, Daniel at the time, um, and that that really compelled me to to kind of get my stuff out there in, in front of more people who could who could give me really really good insight uh, design wise. So so then I've just been, of course attending whenever I can uh, the NYC playtest group and and then I've just become friends with those guys over time but yeah I, I was making I was starting to make the, these kind of games uh, before I was really involved with the community as much as I have been as as with any epic movie this is the kind of the middle bit where it gets a bit sad <laughs> um, you know because we've got to do the kind of the the, the hero kind of getting beaten down a bit you know if there was if this was rocky this would be potentially the bit where his trainer dies yeah it's, um, the, it's the setback in the script i get it it's the set yeah you know it's this is where you you're a creative director I mean, <laughs> that's you right. should have been i know all about it you should be you should you know when you sent me the show notes you should have had this planned out and said okay this bit we're gonna storyboard it but <laughs> um yeah you, you had the build up to Obviously, the first time because it's the second time you're bringing Sovereign Skies to Kickstarter. Yes. Okay. And let's not, let's not. Um, I'm not here to kind of, um, to I guess to to kind of uh, beat down on you or anything like that because that's not fair. Because I, I there's so many Kickstarter campaigns that I'm kind of like I'm equally like going. This one's doing really, really badly, and I have no idea why. Or this one is cancelled, I have no idea why. Or this one is going like a rocket, and I have no idea why. So Kickstarter has become this kind of strange kind of beast where you can never ever tell whether or not a campaign is going to like take off into the stratosphere. Yeah, it's and true. just do ridiculous numbers, right? Or it's gonna f- it's gonna fizzle along. And just manage to fund, or somebody's going to go. This is just, you know, it's kind of just not, just not happening. Um, when you went through the first campaign, did are there things you look back on now and think actually I should have maybe done that kind of differently? Oh, absolutely. Looking back now, pretty much yeah. all of it. <laughs> so, so at the, at the at the time, I I I didn't really have that much control. So so I kind of handed it off to Deepwater and. They were going through some things at the time, but they were trying to stick to their dates. And so, mm-hmm. when it launched, it kind of launched. It launched like the day of Origins, which turned out to be kind of a bad idea in and of itself. But also, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as a creative director, me not having any kind of creative control um, was really bothersome a- after the fact. After we realized it didn't have the momentum that it needed to finish, uh, and and we we went back to the drawing board not only on. Uh, what kind of game it needed to be presented as um, 
in, in we I think they were trying to make it bigger than what it is with with very limited amount of time. So mm-hmm. I really we really wanted to pull back on on the offering, and it's it's a small box game. You get really a lot a lot of depth for very few components um, compared to a lot of larger games with as much thinking. Um, so mm-hmm. we at we at some point we were talking about. Um, ship miniatures and this uh, sort of, I don't know, deluxe edition. Um, so, we, we pulled away from that and got down to kind of the brass tacks of like what makes this game good. It looks good. It plays well. Like it's really smooth. Um, so, so how do we highlight that in the best way we can? Um, and, and really... Uh, now I was kind of handed the reins. Okay, the second time around, how much control do you want? I said, give it to me. I'm just gonna. I'd like to like be in a lot more control with the graphic design of what the Kickstarter yeah. looks like because that really matters. And also, we didn't have the reviewers that we wanted at the time, and that's that's a huge issue. And it was all because of time constraints. And now we were giving ourselves a little bit more time to get ready, and we got the reviewers we wanted this time. Um, we have Game Boy Geek Dan King, and we have uh, Rado, which who absolutely loves the game, which is so fantastic. Um, but once you see how the game plays and how beautiful it looks within this new Kickstarter, you'll realize that the, the, really all along, this should have been something that people were wanting uh, to have uh, on their shelves. So, I, I'm, I'm really confident uh, this time around that, that we're going to do a good job. Um, the, the Kickstarter page, we're still touching up, but it's, it's ready to go. And I'm, I'm super psyched about the second go. Mm. Does it hit your confidence a bit when you're kind of like saying, "I know this is a really good product, and yet I'm not managing to get the." Ma- I especially must have been a bit frustrating oh, as absolutely. like your job, saying, "I'm not managing to get this message across, yeah. and this is driving me up the actual wall." And uh, you know, this the whole thing is coming across as something different than what it, yeah, than kind of what it should be. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, it it all has to do with the quality of your presentation, and it just wasn't there. So it was definitely frustrating. And I was at Origins, and I was stressed out. And I'll be honest: the moment we decided to to shut down the campaign and not see it played mm-hmm. out, I felt so much better because that I knew then at that point, if we were going to do it again. I I would be able to put I would be able to put all of my own effort into it 100% and that's when I, I've yeah. been able to do. So I I think this time around it's going to get it's it's going to get its day in the sun uh because because it is a good game and and it just it, it was just so hard to see what kind of game it was and how well it played with with the way it was presented before and I think I think we've done such a better job this time. Do you think like the things like the minis and looking that into consideration? Do you think that was just? Yeah, I think it was a misstep. Uh, I, I think I think yeah. I think putting so a lot of pressure was put on onto these quality kind of ship miniatures. And the thing is, it's a Euro game, so th- <laughs> there's a specific audience that love minis, and and there are some great minis out there. And to compete yeah. with that that world isn't really where this game where this game needed to be. This game is is a is a midweight Euro game that plays really quickly and there's no combat in it. There's no take that in it. It's it's all just a little thinky diplomatic space rondelle and the miniatures are kind of unnecessary. Now we are doing kind of like wooden uh, ship meeples and custom ones with specific uh, stretch goals. So those are going to be cool, especially for a Euro gamer who usually prefers wooden components over plastic anyway. Um, so I think we're doing our audience uh, right more so this time around. I don't know for whatever reason I'm kind of getting, I'm getting hints of vindication uh-huh, uh-huh. by Orange Nebula, and I have no idea. But I, I, again, that's a game that um, the com- the main components on everything within that game are are cubes. It's wooden cubes. Right. Yes, there are miniatures in the game, but you don't need the miniatures in any way, shape or form in order to be able to play the game. And in fact, you only really need the miniatures in the game if you decide to play kind of ex- certain expansions and stuff like that right, within the right. game itself. But the core itself, the core game itself is I'm taking this wooden cube and I'm putting <laughs> it here. And yeah. I'm taking this I'm taking this um I'm taking this card and I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna take an action. And then or I'm gonna take this uh, map tile and I'm gonna place it down kind of thing and it's simplicity in terms of its components and how it kind of plays out 
that kind of really, really appeals to me because I'm kind of getting over the 50 million miniatures in a box yeah. and 47 kind of page rule book. I kind of want something I can get to the table. And then if there's depth and strategy kind of underneath that opens as you play, then that's yep. more exciting. That's yeah, more kind of you. exciting to me. Kind of, yeah, I, kind I think of my forward. favorite component is just a wooden, a little tiny wooden cube. I don't know why. I just, there's something about uh, the, the wood components that, that really draw me in tech, that tactile mm-hmm. feeling of dropping some wood on a, on a cardboard. That sounds really, that sounded like innuendo and that was not meant to be that. I'm, I'm <laughs> definitely not, ed- I'm not editing that out and I might add in some, I might add in some 1970s guitar gently strumming away in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When, um, when I was a break you, dancer, I would I would also drop wood on cardboard sometimes. <laughs> I just don't. That's just that's a bridge too far. Um, in terms of how you're playing around, because obviously the whole purpose of this conversation is not made to make bad double entendres about stuff, or you know, incur the wrath of mad mass corporations. But we're actually trying to get a message across on how how a game that nobody else has played in the world plays. Do you want to explain to us how you play <clears throat> your game? Oh yeah, sure. That's it. Cough, cough. That's a serious <laughs> cough. That's a... <laughs> Bringing myself back into the room. Damn it. Here yeah. Go. <clears throat> right. Okay. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so right. so basically, in Sovereign Skies, you're a you're one of four er, old Earth. Uh, houses, which we're calling houses, but they're basically factions uh, that fly in to the Abyssi Cluster, which is this six planets on this rondelle. <clears throat> and you're going to fly around and you're going to try to use diplomacy to uh, pick up politic cards uh, and uh, drop ships down onto the planets in order to um, sort of sway the the politicians to give you fa- to do favors for you and and gain influence. Um, so basically, you're just moving a, a mothership uh, either clockwise or counterclockwise. You can always pay two energy to turn around. Uh, you can always move one planet over in orbit for free, and then you pay an energy per to move further around the rondelle, and you'll move once at the beginning of your turn. <clears throat> and then wherever the planet you land on, you'll have three actions. You can do one and get an energy. Or if you do two, you don't pay one, you don't lose one. If you don't lose one, you don't gain one. And if you do all three actions, you actually have to pay an energy to do all three actions. And those actions are pick up a politic card that's unique to that planet, uh, drop a mini ship on that planet, land a ship, uh, and do the special action. Now, each of the six planets have a special action on each one of them um, that allow you to move towards winning the game and and... Three of those actually help you score points. Um, for instance, one is <clears throat> uh, the pledge action. The pledge action is taking any uh, politic cards you might have gotten along the way, and you can pledge up to three of them. Um, you get uh, these little three-point chits. Uh, if you pledge them, that's just putting them back in their stacks, and those go onto your board. However, those can be taken away from you if somebody has a majority on that planet and they pledge too. So you have to maintain majorities on those planets where you've pledged uh, in order to keep those points for the end of the game. That's how you score majorities in this game. It's a really unique, interesting kind of take on uh, area majority. Um, uh, one of the other ways to score is by recruiting uh, the senators and that those are the politicians of the planets and they're all different alien races and they kind of sit in this three card stack um, underneath all of them are these point chits. And if you're the first one in any single one of those rows, you get the top amount and those values descend. Uh, now you have to turn in two of the politic cards for each one of those. There are 15 senators and there's six. So it's uh, six politic cards uh, of the six planets. So each one of them will have a unique combination of two different politic cards that you have to turn in to take those. Uh, once you have that, they have two favors on them. They're two kind of boosted actions that are similar to the planet actions and you can use one and discard it. Of course, you get to keep the points that you grabbed when you recruited. Uh, the other way is to activate bases. So activating a base is super simple. You land on activate and you flip over one of your bases. However, 
you have to build those bases and to build those bases, you have to remove a certain amount of ships from these three different uh, levels of planets. On a green planet, you only have to remove two ships to build a base there. Uh, on the purple planets, you have to remove three. And on the orange planets, you have to remove four. So when you activate on one of those higher valued planets, you're going to get more points because those chit stacks go up higher. The highest number is nine for an orange. So if you'd spent four ships to build a base on any on an orange planet, you're, and you're the first one to do that, you're going to get nine points. The next person will get eight. <clears throat> Basically, at the end of the game, the, uh, the game ends when two of those chit stacks are depleted uh, from both the activation uh, board and the recruit senator board. Um, so it can be two on one of those boards or one from each. Uh, and that plays really quickly. So there's a tension there that, oh my God, somebody's probably going to take that last one this turn. I need to get done what I need to get done. And so you have a lot of choices what you want to do with these politic cards and then how you want to spend your time. Do you want to spend it building ships? I mean, building bases uh, with ships. You want to be putting down ships every time or do you want to save your energy so you can get further around the board when you need to? Um, so, so there's a lot of meaty choices in there, um, and and also the tension from kind of how quickly it all starts to ramp up and end. Did you have do you have an optimum number of players for it then? Um, I mean, when you were designing it and deciding, it. I mean, it sounds to me it's I mean it's like it is my kind of interested little bag. You know, yeah. My ears, if they prick up anymore, um, <laughs> then. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, you know. I think I think the sweet spot is three, and I, I think that's just kind of in consensus. Although I really do enjoy a four-player game because you get a lot of a lot more um, interaction uh, with with uh -huh. a lot more push and pull with the majorities on the on the planets, um, and and two is 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 a much more cutthroat game, I think, between two players. Um, it, it can be much a much closer game, um, and it's but it's really fun actually. And the one player version of that is just is um, uh, designed by John Prather, who did Fire in the Library. He um, oh yeah set yeah. up a, a, a wonderful one player version and basically using the components that are already in the game, the the cards, uh, and a method on how to create a second player that works a little differently. We call it the AI, which I think a lot of people call it that for one player. But in a sci-fi game, it makes a lot more sense. Um, and, and that's it's actually really, really great. It's a great solo. Um, I've enjoyed that a lot. So three player was it? Yeah, is 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 fantastic. But I, you know, I yeah. and I'm of course biased, but all player counts are are really really good. Yeah. Yeah, was it strange kind of somebody taking your baby and then going away and saying, right, I've worked on a solo play for you and you're just going to go and, okay, just, you know, you'll bring her back in one piece. Kind of like, <laughs> you know, hand solo with a falcon. Kind of yeah. Thing. yeah, yeah, it's fine. Not a scratch, you know, kind of thing. And then it's like, and they brought it back and you play it on the table and you're like, damn, I mean, this is good. Yeah, this is well, a good, it was, yeah, was kind of like, solo yeah, play. it was kind of like that. John and I had a bunch of calls and, and I know John very well and he, I, I knew that he, he had a good idea for it from the beginning. Um, and so I trusted him to kind of run with it. And no, I, I it wasn't my baby sort of thing ever really for me. I mean, I, I feel like every game because, because of play testing is really about a community building a game anyway. I don't, this game, I couldn't have made this game in a vacuum. This game was created mm. by all the people that gave me advice along the way. I mean, that's, I think that's true of most designers in their games. What's it been like with the playtesting? I mean, have you had, um, did you go, did you go back out and do some more playtesting when the Kickstarter kind of failed to fund? Was there that panic to say, oh my, have I actually got a game here? Or did, yeah. did you go out and seek um, a little bit of more feedback from not, the playtesters? Yeah, not really. I mean, the game has been solid for a while, um, pretty much all of this year. Uh, mm -hmm. Ian Zhang was, was, is the developer and he was just, he's really taken the game to a, a fantastic place. Um, he and I worked really closely on making sure that it was the best game possible and it was really, really ready to go since then. Although 
there there is there's a couple of the expansions that we've been playtesting. So we're we're still working on get, making sure that the expansions play really well. Uh, there's two 18 card expansions yeah. that are like part of stretch goals. Uh, there's also yeah. a a variable player power expansion that's just four cards that allow each of the factions to have a, an extra special ability uh, along the way. And, and so that I play tested a couple times myself, and that's working pretty well. But for the most part, the base yeah. game is is really solid. So we haven't really messed with it that much. Although there is there was a there was a little uh, tweak um, just for the sake of rules clarity in the pledge action because it can get a little it's it's such a new kind of unique thing that it's not the easiest thing to follow um, when you're trying to explain it to someone. But once you get it, it it's it's pretty clear. Yeah, I think blind blind play testing is probably one of the most important things that you can do. Yeah, and I think yeah, I've I've um, even in um, even in the games that I've kind of like kind of played for kind of like Kickstarter versions, you'd be amazed the number of kind of obvious little rules that you kind of go, oh, I'm not sure if I'm meant to be doing this or doing that. I need some kind of clarification. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's not usually the big, huge, chunky, cheeseburger type rules are the ones where everything kind of is explained to the ninth degree. But then on the other side, you're sitting here and going, right, I've got three cards in my hand. Do I put all of them down or do I keep them in my hand? And it's like, oh, yeah, we didn't tell you, did we? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you're just like, oh, all right, okay, yeah, okay, 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 I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. Yeah, I, um, and I think I think it's really important in the rules that you have example play throughout uh, a rule book to really show, to express how a game plays in certain circumstances. And that's something we didn't have in the rule book. Uh, at the first Kickstarter either. So I don't know if somebody downloaded it and they just don't know what's going on, but that's something that we're working mm-hmm. on updating for this launch as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you approached things differently in terms of making noise and getting your name kind of out there as well? Have you been kind of out more in the community and <laughs> making people aware the game exists and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, did, we didn't We did have uh, much of a... a a Facebook push last time and this time around I have a Sovereign Skies Facebook page and that's really helped I mm-hmm. think um, and we did some A-B testing with with uh, Facebook ads I mean Facebook ads is really where you get a lot of attention um, and you just I mean it's just some a necessary evil I think <laughs> to to just put the money there uh, a lot of it there but also also getting the right kind of reviewers helps as well I mean Rado is just such a big name um in in doing previews is so awesome and and because he'll give his real opinion like it's something that you can actually trust like he's never going to say mm-hmm. something he doesn't mean um so i think that's really important too we didn't have him before uh so it's yeah that's that's been a big part of it uh, the reason i think i like rado is because he does the kind of the playthroughs as i would play through a game and it's not always kind of like the pristine Kind of. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not kind of like high, high production every single time there's a slight mistake. He basically says, look, I'm going to run through this and, you know, if I make a mistake, you're just going to have to hold on and stick on the subtitles and there'll be kind of clarifications and stuff like that as well. And I know that as far as his opinion goes, he's he's kind of tried to back off a little bit on the what he thinks but I think you kind of get a good idea of what, not what he's thinking, but I get a good idea of whether or not I like a game yeah. based on how he plays it. If he ends up getting kind of halfway through and he's just like the Klingon subtitles are flying across the screen like nobody's business, it's like, well, how easy enough of a game is this to pick up? <laughs> I know. You know, if somebody like yeah. Rado, who's, be, who's played literally hundreds of new games, if he's finding it difficult to actually pick a game up and run with it, then... You know, I'm not very clever. I mean, this is not going to be a good time for me. I'm probably going to leave that game kind of, um, kind of completely alone. Um, yeah, and he he did the uh, he he did a solo run through of Sovereign Skies, which is so fantastic because we hadn't we mm-hmm. hadn't really had any of that on film yet, and uh, and that I that's that's something I really appreciated. Know what he was going to do, um, but it's such a great run through. It's it's really awesome to see uh, he enjoy him enjoy kind of that. That, that player count, which is, you know, that's a hard sell, I think, for a lot of games. Uh, yeah, I think sometimes with a, um, 
the single player one is a case of is it kind of being properly developed or is it kind of like a, a sometimes a tacked on right. bit because I know it's interesting because I know he kind of plays the game when he's playing it almost in a solo mode I know he's got his kind of his partner in the yeah. background there and he says they're playing away but he sometimes he's kind of like saying oh well this is what they would do and this is what I'm going to kind of do so it's almost like he's kind of running through a solo variant when on the two player which is always kind of which is always kind of kind of interesting um in terms of like kind of the other side of marketing have you been flexing you're kind of your own marketing fingers by looking at kind of what's going to work on the campaign, what's going to attract people. Have you done a bit more of a deep dive based on your own kind of personal experience? What you think is going to is going to get people kind of moving from having a quick scroll through to kind of going up and pledging? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's something that Nolan and I really, really discussed at length. Um, what we thought, mm-hmm. what we think is working out there in the market now compared to kind of the the missteps that we that we saw with, with our previous campaign. So we wanted to make sure that that we're doing what what we see as as helping uh, successful campaigns right now um, happen on on Kickstarter mm-hmm. and and also um, yeah just just making our ads really pretty. <laughs> That's something that 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 we weren't doing before. You know I. It's like I I just want to get into Photoshop and make things as, as beautiful as I can. Like the art, yeah. we have such a an awesome cover for the box. Um, it's art by Giacomo Tappiner, and but I basically took his art and kind of beefed it up in Photoshop and created that that cover for it. And that's just something I'm super proud of, and I want to like get out there because that's that cover really helps sell the game. Um, but also all of the just all of the art that. Giacomo did for us in the game is just so pretty um and then mixing that with with graphic design it just it just helps so much and then being able to show that off being able to advertise that I think helps as well so I'm hoping it's it's translating um and helping us get the message out Uh, have you seen the um have you seen the Moonrakers game yeah have you seen their campaign yeah Um, it really really beautiful absolutely just Stunning, but they're they're kind of um they're also well they're an animation studio, yeah. So one is you know, uh, yeah, just a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> you know they were on the I think they were on the they were on the show uh, just over a week ago. You see, oh, okay. So we had a chat. Gotcha. So it's interesting. There's some kind. Of, I'm seeing some kind of similarities and parallels between two. Well, you know, a group of individuals from you know kind of like both kind of professional kind of creative industries and one of them from advertising and one of you know they're both kind of in that field kind of thing right and i'm just kind of saying you know this is there's very very there's a lot of kind of similar similarities and how you're kind of how you're kind of approaching things as well but how much is how much is the kind of the the entry on the door yeah you've so dropped it yeah, you we, dropped we did. it since the last time we did yeah. we did because we really want to give everyone an option because really if we're just selling a base game um i mean with Kick, uh, the stretch goals as well. We really wanted to give people a value, especially if we're we're distributing it directly from you know because with Kickstarter you're not you're not distributing to your 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 friendly lo- local game stores. You're you're getting a big margin there, so a bigger margin at least. Um, mm-hmm. So we wanted to make sure that people really got that value, and that was really important. Um, I think I think. The, so MSRP will be like thirty nine, and and we just had that up as the price uh, for the base game previous um, with with a deluxe version at like eighty, you know, seventy nine, whatever it was, and it it just didn't yeah. feel like it was enough value. And I think now knocking ten dollars off and saying, look, if you back this Kickstarter, you will get the best price you can possibly get for this game right off the bat, at least yeah. you know in the beginning. So. So I think that I thought that was really important. That's something that we discussed as well. We were like, look, we, we need to show that what we're what we're offering, we want this to be out there. We want people to feel like they're getting an, an amazing value in the in the game that they're going to back. So so that's something I really push for as well. Has that made you had to kind of think about um controlling your costs in terms of going for the stretch goals as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's some things that we're, yeah, we're, we're just we weren't going to do. You can't do it as a stretch goal if if you're trying yeah. to to have a good a really good price point like that. Uh 
like we have metal coins, but we we don't have those as a stretch goal. But it's, it's they're very expensive, so that has become like an add on um, that that we're looking into. Yeah. So hopefully you'll be able to just like if you really love it and you want the metal coins, you can pay ten bucks and get those added on. No. Yeah, yeah, because it's twenty nine bucks is what you're looking at. Yeah, which is. That's very lower end for Kickstarter. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, I don't mean really that. A, I don't mean that in a kind of. Yeah, I don't mean that in a kind of a, um, a nasty way. Because I mean, <laughs> most Kickstarters I see. No, most Kickstarters I see, they're kind of like, you're heading into a hundred dollars, and then it's upwards, and then it's like, oh, you can buy all these, kind of time exclusive expansions, and then you can right. buy these things that are Kickstarter exclusive, and the next thing you know, you're parting with like the best part of a yeah. couple hundred dollars. No, it's really true. The the value is fantastic. Right. And we're, I mean, the things that we're throwing in there, um, we're talking about adding these three mini expansions in there if the, if those stretch goals mm-hmm. are reached and, and making, having these meeples be custom shapes and all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, the value just continues to get better as, as more, we get more backers. So that's good. Has it got you excited again now you, it, you're kind of going back it out does. there? It yeah. does. I'm super excited this time around. I mean, it, it, if something ha- ha- would happen to go wrong, you just never know with Kickstarter. I can at least say this time around, I I, I went in 100%. I, I did everything I could to make to make this game a reality um, mm-hmm. from start to okay. finish. So, I'm, I, okay. I'm the only one to blame this time. Uh, we have we um we have that on tape Adam, and um you know if if it doesn't go right then what I'm going to do is I'm going to release a small ten minute um episode which is just repeatedly just saying you're to blame but also because you know, it's the least yeah. I, least I can do and if it makes a million I'm also the one to profit so just know that <laughs> there you go absolutely absolutely we're not going to tap out in this one. Um, and there goes our profit. Um, <laughs> um, if um, if people have listened along and they want to find out some more, where can they find you on the internet webs? Where do you exist, young man? Um, I can be found on Twitter at Internet's Magic. Internet's Magic. Yeah, it's 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 a screen name, a blast from the past. Uh, just silliness, but but that is my screen name. Um, and then of course you can, you can reach me through my, uh, Facebook page, Sovereign Skies Facebook page as well. And I also have a Facebook page called Games by Aaron Wilson. Um, that one's pretty easy to find too. Uh, I'm also on, I guess, Instagram and Internet's Magic as well. So any of those places you can reach me, just follow me on Twitter. That's the best. It's kind of the best. That's where I play the the most. Yeah. That is the best. That's where you see him hanging about. (laughs) That's right. Just, you know, that's, hanging out. That's where I send you silly gifts. It just, I can't even talk about that. <laughs> um, if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, the quickest thing to do is to go to the internet webs and search for We Are Not Wizards and you find us. Because we do Instagram and we do Facebook and we do Twitter and we've got our website um, and we've also got our blog, which is we're not wizards.blogspot.com. Um, you can find us on all the podcast catchers where they use the word pod in their name and they use the word cast in their name and they don't use either of them in their name like Stitcher. So there you go. If you like what you've listened to tonight, then consider two things. The first thing is go and tell somebody else, you know, because as I've said, um, and we've had complaints about this, but so that's good. I'm causing controversy that we spread like a nasty virus. <laughs> um, so thanks, thanks to all the thanks to all the anti-vaxxers. And then somebody pointed out that you can't vaccine do vaccine things against the virus. So that entire statement is incorrect. So I don't know where I'm going with it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Tell people. Fantastic. Thanks. And the other thing you can do is you can go to Apple Podcasts. As I say, we're number 23 in the games chart in Azerbaijan, and we'll try to get a 22. I don't know who's trying to beat us, but, we'll, you know, we just want twenty-two to help. <laughs> <laughs> All right, clever clogs. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, but there's a couple of things you can do. You can drop a subscription on Apple Podcasts. You can drop us a rating or review. If you are going to be giving us a rating or review, don't give us 10 stars because it makes us big-headed. But don't give us one star because it makes us cry. And uh, you're just seeing the tracks of my tears. Um, give us something in the middle, like a five, because it's, you know, average. And we're just a little bit average. But the person who's not being average 
It's rather wonderful, rather fantastic. He's the he's the king of space in those sovereign <laughs> skies. It's, it's, I, yeah, it's, I'm starting it's to space Aaron, out right now. Aaron Listen Wilson. to you. It's Aaron Wilson. <laughs> Thank you thanks so much. much for coming hey, up. thanks for having me. I really, I really had fun. That's good. Sorry, that's I, good. more dad jokes next time. I promise. I, this, you've just absolutely failed us, and that's going to be the title of the show. <laughs> no, jad, no dad jokes here. Um, there's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Aaron? We are not wizards. There you go. Fantastic. <laughs> hey, I'm doing magic here. <laughs> um, and That's perfect. And the second, the second thing is to say goodbye. Um, so goodbye from Aaron. Say goodbye, Aaron. Okay. Goodbye, Aaron. And it's a goodbye for me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. Make something awful. And check out Sovereign Skies when it comes to Kickstarter, because it should be coming to Kickstarter by the time this is released. Um, so you can go and check the show notes and press the button and give it a look, and then you know, take it from there. Yes. But until the next time, goodbye. Goodbye. Dropping some wood on a on a cardboard. Dropping some wood on a on a cardboard. Dropping some wood on a on a cardboard. he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. Dropping some wood on a on a cardboard.